The following program is a special presentation of the Big Ten Network, produced in association with the University of Iowa. Welcome to Conversations from the Iowa Writers Workshop. I'm Keisha Lynn. Paul Harding is currently experiencing what most writers dream of. He has just published his first novel, Tinkers, and so far it has received near universal acclaim from critics and readers. Publishers Weekly calls Tinkers an especially gorgeous example of novelistic craftsmanship. Paul Harding has taught at Harvard and the University of Iowa, and yes, he is a graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop. Paul Harding, welcome. Oh, thanks, Keisha. It's wonderful uh, to be here. I have to say, I love Loved when I was doing research for this novel, uh, read it for this interview, um, the Dallas Morning News review opens up with this great quote that I have to read. She says, when this novel arrived, I thought, oh, good, a nice little short book. It turned out to be a nice big short book. And by little, she, she's talking about this book. This is the book, Tinkers. It's tiny. It came out in paperback. It's 191 pages long. Yet there is so much in this book. It's like a great oak of a book. Can you talk about where this book came from? Where did it start? I guess the seeds for the oak, I guess. Acorn. Well, I guess it's, it started off originally as a short story mm -hmm. that I wrote, um, and, and people to whom I showed it seemed to, seemed to like it, but they said it was terribly elliptical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and so they, everybody, it's that nice phenomenon as a writer when people say they want more, you know, so you figure, okay. Um, and, and so I kept, I mean, the, the, the kernel of the story, the sort of prompt for the story, uh, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the stories that my maternal grandparents used to tell me. They were both from northern Maine. Um, and they lived very difficult lives up there. And um, for whatever reason, when they sort of came out of the woods, as it were, they were very reluctant to elaborate much about their family stories. So I'd have these little one or two sentence kind of linchpin sort of um, uh, family stories, anecdotes from them about, you know, for example, my grandfather's. My grandfather's father had epilepsy and left my grandfather's family when he um, when he um, got wind of of of, of, of my grandfather's mother's um, plans to have him sent to an asylum. So, but then my my so my that was that's a that's truth, you know, that's fact. Um, but um, my grandfather would never tell me any more about it, and so I just gathered all these you know these little these little snippets, and so I just started to write the novel or just pile prose up basically, where I would just you know take this and it would be sort of like the kernel or the nucleus of an idea, and I would just sort of write my way out from those moments. Um, and so they became these sort of linchpins that we eventually began to overlap and sort of speak to each other. So it's interesting. You didn't do this from, I mean, people write novels in many different ways. And sometimes I, I always hear about people who are able to write from A to B. And, oh, yeah. you know, but you, it sounds like you kind of did a piling on. Is that a good way yeah, to describe or, it? Or, or, or collaging, collaging or yeah. you know, I often thought of it as painting mm -hmm, in a way where you just mm -hmm. keep painting over and keep painting over and then you rub something out and paint over right. it so you get all these kind of what like palimpsests or yeah. what do they call it pentimenti you know mm -hmm. in painting when you can see the layers underneath the surface yeah. and all that sort of stuff and there's a very pleasing qual I mean I found that after a while it ended up that ended up lending a pleasing quality and, and a density to the writing that sort of it's, I think the manuscript was maybe 40,000 words, a very, very short, yeah. um, but I wanted it to, you know, it was 40,000 words long, I wanted to make it 150,000 deep or whatever, you know, just, yeah, just yeah. a richness and mm -hmm. density to the prose. Well, and again, density is the key thing here. I think it's Elizabeth McCracken who says this is a demonstration of the enormity of fiction, but also the econom the economy of fiction. This is 191 pages in which you go from, uh, you know, the, the story goes across time, it goes across generations, you've got these three generations of men, and, you know, and you describe, you know, their life. Like you said, it's in the New England countryside at the turn of, the, you know, it's the 19th century, 20th century. Can you talk about some of the research you did for this novel? Um, I did next to no research. It's, it's sort of interesting. I mean, one of, the, one of the reasons that this turned into a novel was that while I was a the whole time I was a student at the workshop, I was working on this novel that was set in, in, the, um, in a Mexican colonial silver mine in the 16th century. Um, and it was about a little girl who disguises herself as a boy so that she can work in the silver. And that became so overburdened with research because it's sort of like what would the german mining engineers and the and you know and the missionaries and the pre you know pre columbian you know it, it, you know indigenous people and it, it just got so that 
Every sentence I wrote was so overburdened with research and sort of apparatus and annotation that I couldn't just write sort of what I was preoccupied with. You know, we tell writing students about detail yeah. and about how important detail is mm -hmm. to, to the story. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, part of the, I mean, the, the way that I write, I mean, there's, there's te you know, strictly speaking, there's very little plot in yeah, the novel. Right. You know, I mean, the epicenter of the book is the guy leaving his home, and then everything sort of, again, works out, you know, anticipates that, moves towards it, away from it, all that. So that's the sort of epicenter of the. Um, and so, because I write entirely by character, mm -hmm. you know, and so when you're thinking in terms of character and you're thinking that closely, you're aligning your own kind of imagination with your character's yeah. inner lives. Um, every matter of detail becomes a matter of character. You want to make the, 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 dense, the description dense enough so that you can, you can register every little flicker of the character's consciousness as they experience it. And so then, um, you know, so with the landscape, I mean, this is the landscape that these people are sitting in front of. So as I'm describing landscape, I mean for it to come across as um, it, it illuminates character. And, and the landscape itself is kind of a character. It is indeed. An antagonist sometimes, very and much, a protagonist. Very you much know. so, yeah. 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 Absolutely, the antagonistic part of the New England countryside, describing Howard again is a tinker. He is a definition being an itinerant, salesman who fixes things, also provising, but you describe him going with his wagon into the countryside in this area of Maine where you get the sense these people disappear for the winter, you know, yeah, and they might and come I, out. They really did. Yeah. I mean, and, and to some extent, they still do, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's still, it's very, very, I mean, where we go fishing, it's very, very remote, you know, no electricity, really, sort of just fire up the generator a couple hours. And, and so there, is, there really is this sense, I mean, I, I, mean, I live down in Boston, which yeah. is, you know, sort of winter's cold and snowy, but I find myself all winter down in Boston thinking, what must it be like up in the woods up there? You know, yeah. just this very, and so just thinking that that, that, that sort of, that sort of shapes the disposition of these people. Um, and, you know, I, all, I mean, I'm just a real fan of landscape mm -hmm. in, as character yes. in literature, mm -hmm. painting, all that sort of stuff. Anyways, you know, cinematography, all that. Um, you know, big, big, big fan of Wallace Stevens. You know, just what he does with the, you know, the, the weather almost yeah. as as consciousness too. Right. So I just really, and I think that all comes up to to light. You know, how you work with light and how you describe light. And, and painting, you know, all that kind of visual Painting. stuff. That's, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, um, I want to get back to the characters real quick with George, because this book yeah. opens up with George dying. I mean, we start out, you said not a lot happens in terms of plot. Um, George is dying, but he goes back in time, and we get to see the story of his father, this tinker who has epilepsy, and then we actually go back even further and see the story of his father. Right, Was right. there any particular character? For me, I felt Howard really stuck out, that he was my favorite character. Was there one in particular that stuck with you? I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, you know, because I have sort of different, you know, I think of them almost as, you know, sort of the foreground, the middle ground, sure. and, the, you know, that sort of, so the, the, you know, the character of George, who's the, the, you know, he's dying in the present, the now of the, of, of the novel. I mean, he, it, that's the closest to my own experience with my, my own grandfather, you know, that's the, and then Howard becomes more imagined, you know, uh, I sort of know a few, th knew a few things about this fellow, so I just sort of made the, and then I just st started thinking, well, isn't this interesting? You, keep, you could just keep going back and back. And so then, the, then you get back to this, you know, uh, Howard's father, who was a Methodist minister 19, in the 19th century in, in Maine. And I, I, re I was talking with somebody today, and I just re they asked me, what is his name again? I said, he doesn't have a name. He doesn't have a name. And, and you get no. into this. I mean, I always thought of that as almost like the Old Testament part of the book, mm -hmm. the patriarchs, getting right. back into this. He just, he's almost, he exists almost as nothing more than a ghost. And so this, it's just almost legendary. Mm -hmm. There's this legendary quality to him. And, um, you know, so that just felt like the, you know, the terminus, the, 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 the deepest path that I could go into, and then just moving. Um, but I mean, also to you know to get back to Howard. I mean, you know, the whole section about Howard's father, I think, is about Howard because yes. it's his memories of his father, and so that illuminates him. I, you know, Howard is, I think, the main character of the yeah. book. You've taught at Harvard. Are you teaching at Harvard now? At the, in the extension school. Okay. I, taught, I taught undergraduate there for seven years. Um, Harvard's equivalent of freshman comp, right. basically. Right. Yeah. But you've also taught here at the university. I did while I was here. While as you were a, here. As, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. So I, what kind of things do you want to get what your students to take away from your classes? I don't know. I mean, I suppose that there's, I don't know, I, you know, 
one of the things that I always find myself talking to my students about is just, um, and, and I mean, I, this has to do with you know student writing, what you often see with student writing, and what you want to correct. But what I try to tell my students is, is uh, I'll try to leave them with the idea that what you need to do is you need to write as clearly and precisely and straightforwardly as possible about things that are truly mysterious. You know, as opposed to um, writing obscurely about things which once you, once you sort of figure out what the, the conceit is of the prose or the, the trickery or the, you know, the little skeleton key, the code ring for it, um, just proves to be received opinion. You know, um, and because that's that's how you're going to that's how you're going to make. Uh, I mean, I'm always obsessed with durability. You know, the fact that um, the, the the fact that you want your your stories or your poems or your novels to last. You know, there's this <laughs> there's also this phenomenon that you always have to fight against, which is just the idea that. Um, and I even you know get this with some you know some of the not so nice things that have been said maybe about the book. The, the idea that um, I. You know, some people object when they can't understand what the whole book is about the first time they read it. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's just a sign of the generosity and richness of the book that you can go back and you can keep, it keeps, up, it keeps <laughs> opening, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a rate at which the story will release deeper and deeper meaning to you if it, if it, if it works well. Because one of the things I always say to my students is that um, have you, did, you haven't looked at your favorite painting once. You haven't, you haven't you know, seen your, watched your favorite movie once. You don't listen. You haven't listened to your favorite album once. There's no, you know, none of those things that you, you know, none of your favorite works of art are things that you you, know, you read at once and then you just assume. But for some reason, with reading, sometimes there's this idea that sort of, uh, you know, you want to be able to just say, "I got the point," you know, that sort of. Thing. And I, I think the best art doesn't have points. You you, you you know, you can't. You, you want to. You know, I, I'm always you know trying to get them to think about you know irreducibility, mm -hmm. make, mm -hmm. make, making art that's really. Get it, leading your readers to a place where we're all just sort of together, right. we're all <laughs> wondering together. about all of this, and, right. there's, and there's a kind of camaraderie about that, and there's a kind of um, there's a kind of you know this idea, you know, the, you know the, 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 the spirit of common endeavor, you know that the and, and, and that all has to do with you know talking about the relationship between the the writer and the reader, and yeah. never talking yeah. down to your reader and never being pedantic, that sort of thing. Absolutely, uh, Toni Morrison gets that same criticism a lot about her books, and I, I find myself defending. You know, it's like this is the book you have to keep. There's so much here, oh, and there's so no, many layers. This book, it'll be here forever. Okay? Yeah, <laughs> Beloved and Sula is yeah. one that I. It's just it's. Every time I reread it, just, it's, I mean, I, I often, I mean, I always think of other artistic metaphors, you know, but the, I mean, that's like, it's like a chamber music, or it's like, a, you know, it's, it's the way it's orchestrated and the way that if it works right in here, you know, since I sort of collage things, you, you get the, you know, it's, it's like if you put, um, you know, two notes together, they do something else, you know, if you put two colors next to each other, you, you start getting these, you know, they start precipitating harmonies or other experiences off them. And, and in, in literature, you know, those things start to resonate and harmonize in ways that um, you, you can't investigate, you can't experience them all in any single reading, you know? And so your understanding of your favorite novel is something that is, is, um, is a relationship you have with that work of art over your whole life. Absolutely. Kind know? of like, and since we're talking about musical language resonating and harmonizing and how you re-experience music in different ways, mm -hmm. in your not-too-distant past life, you were a musician. I was a drummer. You were <laughs> Some a people drummer. make a distinction no, between that's, that. That's a musician. <laughs> <laughs> you you were you played you worked you played for a band called Cold Water Flat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was in the nineties. Yeah, that was in the um, early mid nineties. Mid nineties. Yeah. 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 Tell me about that experience. How long were you? I don't. You know, I I played drums forever. You know, I just always wanted to be in a band, and I was sort of I always wanted to be in a band. I was I never you know I I wasn't a drummer who sort of. Go, went out to the woodshed and sort of practiced my chops. So I was, you know, rock drummer, sort of, you know, sort of take, <laughs> take it for what it is. But um, so I always played in bands. I was playing in clubs in Boston when I was like 15 years old, 16, so sneaking in them, you know, that sort of thing. And then, um, you know, when I was at the University of Massachusetts, I, I met this guy, Paul Janowitz, and he and I just started this band. And, um, and, and yeah, we put out a couple albums. We were on MCA for one, one album. And, I mean, I would, you know, I would say that we sort of flirted with the bottom rung of international notoriety for six <laughs> months. <laughs> you know, that's a very, but you know, like so we were on a major label for a little bit, and we, you know, did some world, you know, we toured around Europe and North America a few times, played with some, you know, pretty big 
you know, large groups at the time, that sort of thing. Um, and it was just a great experience, you know. Was, I mean, I, I would have not, at that time, I would, have, would not have had the means to have gone to Europe, for example. And wonderful way to travel because every town you show up in, people are happy to see you. They've invited you there. <laughs> you know? yeah. And. Um, and I liked it for you know the rock and roll lifestyle. I mean, I did like you know the you know, um, but um, you know it's really funny. I mean, the differences between being a drummer in a rock band and writing a novel are actually more superficial than you might think because yeah. one of them you know it's 130 decibels and it's noisy and it's, you know in a in a club, but it scratches the same itch. You get the same that same sort of. I think that's also, the, you know, the way I, when I, I write sort of what I would call a sort of lyrical prose, right. as it were, you know, the Absolutely. sort of very, um, and that. it comes yeah. from being a drummer. Yeah. It comes from, you know, thinking about the ca cadence and rhythm and, you know, moving to different time signatures and all that sort of stuff around. This book was picked up by a press that is fairly, I believe they're fairly new, Bellevue, Bellevue Literary yeah, Press? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. it's great. Um, you know, there, there is a very small press. There, it's the, I mean, Bellevue, they are located in Bellevue, yeah, Bellevue. Hospital. I thought that was great. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and they're, um, they, it's, um, they are, uh, it's run out of the NYU Medical School, and most of what they publish is nonfiction, and their mission statement, more or less, is sort of, you know, medicine and humanism, that kind of thing. But they, um, but they publish, they publish, I think, one fiction title per list. Um, and it's just wonderful. I mean, you hear all these kind of dreadful, you know, stories about the publishing industry collapsing. And I mean, my experience with with um, trying to sell Tinkers was, you know, sort of um, brief and unambiguous. Mm -hmm. I sent it to a couple of commercial <laughs> houses, a couple of commercial agents, and all of them said, "They all said no." Absolutely not. Wow. Um, and I think part of that has to do with, you know, somebody. You, 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 you know, you have to convince an agent, or the book has to convince an agent that she can convince an editor, that the editor can convince the marketing department. These days, you know, I, mean, I think that's a, unfortunate. That's a, um, and so, in the case of Bellevue, this woman, you know, Erica Goldman, you know, has been editor before. I can't remember where, um, but she. Um, she was able to just buy the book, and it's just you know for very modest, you know, very, but but. Um, it's heartening because it's it's been picked up and reviewed and it's selling and all this sort of stuff. Doing so very it's, well. Tell me about your experience at Iowa. When did you come here? I was here from uh, '98 to 2000. Okay. And um, and it was wonderful. You know, I I I, I came here. It's sort of interesting because in, in a former life I was kind of a musician. You know, I sort of. I was ask you about that. <laughs> spent, yeah. Oh, so we can talk about. But I, you know, so I, I basically to start at the end of being a musician. You know. The band I was in, bro you know, broke up, and I thought, what, what now? I can't get a job. This is be worst of all. God so, forbid. And yeah. yeah. I thought, oh, well, you know, I've always kind of liked writing, you know, and I've always been an avid reader, um, and so I wrote a story and took us got into a summer workshop at Skidmore College, the New York Summer Writers Institute. And um, just by luck of the draw, um, it was a class with Marilyn Robinson. And I, you know, um, within 10 minutes of her walking into the room, I just said, this person is just magnificent. And I just, you know, as a lot of people do, just sort of just, just fell in love with her and yeah. her writing and just her as a person. She, you know, um, uh, uh, and I just said, you know, wherever she teaches, I got to be there. I got to be there. I got to be there. Um, and so yeah. Yeah, I wrote a couple more stories over the next year or so, and just very, very fortunate, got in, came here. and. And then, and then I found out she was not going to be here for the two years. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> she came back at the very end, but I was, you know, again, just sort of very fortunate that the, the first year I was here, um, uh, an English novelist named Barry Unsworth was here for a year, and I um, became very good friends with him. It was all Barry all the time, took his workshops, his seminars. I mean, still see him and his wife wherever, whenever they're, you know, on, they live in Italy, so I see them whenever they come over, come over here. Um, and you know, it's just wonderful. And it's just a wonderful experience to just like, I mean, the workshop really is sort of, here you go, here's time to write, do your thing. Very, very sort of, um, I had worried that it was gonna be over-determined and it just wasn't, it was just wonderful. And I was also very fortunate to study with Elizabeth McCracken, who yeah. was just an, ex an astonishingly smart person and talented and generous. She's just such a generous teacher. She's just one of those people that every time I see her, I just have this spontaneous feeling like, she always makes me happy that I'm a writer. You know, yeah. this is sort of the, the ideal, isn't it? Yeah, it's just, it's she's just absolutely wonderful. And then Marilyn came back, and so I got to t have a workshop with her for the last semester. And experience that. So. I know it may be a little early to ask you this question, but what are you working on next? I don't know. It's tough to um, maybe a cycle of stories. Um, I mean, I, I think I, 
I, I'm parochial in the sense that I like this kind of local New England landscape yeah. kind of thing that's going on. I mean, I, I, you, you, as, a, as a writer, you're always trying to strike that balance between um, you don't want to keep going over the same territory, or if you do keep going over the same territory, you want to make sure that you precipitate new visions out of the same territory, you know? And when it works, it's like Faulkner, you know, like nobody, nobody's sad that Faulkner is going back to the son of the South, whose sister's, you know, honor is whatever, you know, that sort of thing. When he does it right, it's really quick. Um, so in this case, um, I'm just working on some short stories, but you know, for example, I didn't publish many short stories while I was working on this, but I published one in the Harvard Review last year, a couple years ago now, um, and George is actually in it for a line or two. Right, <laughs> He's sort okay. of on the couch and says something yeah. grumpy. To, so just this idea that it, it may be not entirely unlike Yokna, Yokna Patafa, mm -hmm. um, you know, <laughs> that, um, that um, yeah, Faulkner again is, um, it might be different people, but it's the same place, and they might intersect, and different people might have walk-on parts. And just, just again, because it's just the milieu. It's just so immediate to me. It's just so right there for me. So, whatever I'm obsessing over, I can immediately just put it into the light, the atmosphere, the architecture, the weather, the people, the you know that sort of thing. So, yeah. looking forward to seeing more. Thank, oh, you thank you so That's much for joining us today. Oh, this wonderful. is Paul's new book, Paul Harding, Tinkers. I'm going to reread this because this is something that deserves to be read and reread. Thank you for joining us at Conversations from the Iowa Writers Workshop. I'm Keisha Lynn. The preceding program was produced by the University of Iowa in association with the Big Ten Network.